Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. Another Saturday night, I guess, is upon us, so we will get here started here momentarily. I got three people on, so who do we have? If you want to comment, that is always wonderful to know. I always enjoy knowing who's here because I never believe that the thing works, and sometimes there's more than three. So hope everybody is having a wonderful, wonderful Saturday, I guess. So, hey, Corey, I figured you'd be on here. I saw Corey this morning. Thank you for coming to Coffee and Clicks, as always. I bet you Connie will be on here momentarily, hopefully Pamela. But if not, you can all catch it on the replay. So, yeah, I think that room, room, if I could speak, worked out really, really well this morning. So that is our room for the end of the year. And Paul showed up this morning. Hello, Paul. So... Did you try pelicans? I don't know if you got over there. <laughs> I was thinking about this afternoon. You're like, I think I might try pelicans out. Now, who else we got on? Yes, the room was great. I thought it was awesome. So I'm glad they have it. So they just can't get rid of it. So, oh, well, we'll get started here momentarily. We'll see if we get anybody else to pop up. So tonight we're going to kind of talk about the photographic process. So it's kind of a little bit different than I think what I, I realized I spoke about this in the past. And but this is a little bit different. I'm going to kind of split it up. We'll do half this week. Uh, next week, we're going to do something a little bit different. And then I'll finish up the other half the following week. So, so no dogs. That is right, Corey. No damn dogs. Oh, that drove me up the wall. Um, <laughs> It was a great event, good for them, but not for us. Couldn't hear anybody. And I bet you Connie will be happy that all the chairs are on one height now. It's weird seeing somebody up here and somebody down here, and we can all actually hear each other talk. So, yeah, you know. So, well, you know what? We will get started here. You know, somebody will always pop in, so on and so forth. And there we go. So tonight, I am going to talk about like creating your photographic process. Um, this, in my mind, is something that's totally made up per the user. It does not have to be in any particular order. I have mine in a certain order. Other people's have theirs in a certain order. It's just what's right for you, what's comfortable for you. Um, oh, you didn't make it to Pelicans, Paul. Well, one of these days, right? There's always something to look forward to. But this whole process thing, I'm, I don't want to kind of explain this. Processes are good to have and bad to have. Because sometimes when the process that we are working on as artists is not, is not life and death. If we do step three before one, no one's going to die, right? We're not a surgeon or a doctor like that. So it's nice to have these like little checkpoints in place. So when you're out photographing something, you're on a consistent process. So when you're doing it consistently, it's kind of a no-brainer. You don't think about it. You just process it in your head, move on, so on and so forth, and make images. Um, I find that sometimes that process will also get me stuck into a point where that's all you do, right? And then, then we get into this um, complacency, and then that's what we do over and over and over and over, and then we never get out, and our images start to look the same. So it's a really, uh, like, fine balance. But process is process, but it's good to have one. So let's get started here on our first slide. So as always, I got a quote. So creativity is seeing what others see and thinking what no one else ever thought, right? Um, it's kind of hard to do these days if you think about it in the world of photography um, or yeah, I would say in the world of photography for the most part. You know, you go to Yellowstone, we've all seen the same photo. Um, you go to Yosemite, you see all the same photos. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to do that. But I think that's our end goal is if you're going to be creative, we got to try to get past those barriers we've already had before and starting to think out of the box. You've heard me say it before. Don't think like inside the box. Don't think outside the box. Think like there is no box, right? So we don't harness ourselves within these, these four walls and that's where we stay. So then it helps you, you know, as I found as the more I've kind of let loose in a sense and not really worry about all these particular little things like we were talking this morning about um, color calibration and the whole monitor thing. I find that people who do this whole complicated ass system and have all these little things here and here, they just, it's more complicated. Things don't seem to turn out. I don't know if it's Murphy's law. I do the bare basics of lots of things. And guess what? I'm 
getting a lot farther, I feel, than if I had this really tight process. And it kind of dampens the creativity too. But again, process is process. Hello, Diane. It was good to see you today and to join in with us. So I'm glad it's closer to you now so you can join us. So it's always good to have a friendly, well, another friendly face. I said a friendly face like no one else there is friendly. So, you know, but like, again, it's creativity. So I think anytime you go out and take photos, um, it's one of those things is you have creativity in the forefront of your mind, right? Which is then going to lead into our slides. So there's kind of this thing, like I want to call it the four step process. And then there's processes within processes and right. It sounds really boring, but I trust me, it's not. So there's kind of like, this is a very basic bare bones process. Um, when we get into this, these are kind of like the four uh, ways. Now, um, I think the first part of your process, you're going to start seeing what we call the photographic looking and seeing phase. This is where you show up on your scene, and, and I'll go into more details on that in a minute. Then once you've got that kind of figured out, you jump into that composing the whole image scene, or composing the whole image part. Then there, I think there's a lot in between the composing the image part and envisioning a final print. And it could be really just envisioning your final image. And then taking that, envisioning that final image and going to final print. Because um, I was doing a post that we'll post tomorrow about prints. Um, and it's kind of funny because where are they? I don't know what happened to them. I lost them already. Oh, well. Um, on my desk, I had some prints, but I don't know where they went. I found a bunch of photos today, but you'll see them. I'll post them tomorrow. Um, but I was just recently heard about there's a generation that is the most photographed that will have no photographs. That, that boggled my mind. So I got looking into it thinking, how is that possible? Yeah, that's right. Guess what? Nobody prints. You know, we put them on digital devices. And then as I was reading this article more, they would say in 10 years, there will be no photos, though they have them. I'm like, I'm kind of confused by that. And when I got looking into it, well, they were saying most of these photos of this generation is stored on other types of media, CDs, those kind of things, floppy disks. Well, guess what? Those are all pretty obsolete. This thing is the most obsolete thing, but it still sits on my desk. It plugs into my Mac and it still reads CDs. Why? Because in my trash can is, if I dig one out, guess what? CDs. So my mom's like, when I came home from uh, vacations. Like, I got a bunch of your stuff in boxes. You want to go through it? Um, this CD was a 700 megabyte CD. That was big in the day. And I wrote on here basketball slash newspaper, meaning this was basketball work. So if you think about it, it's kind of crazy. Like, there's images on this, right? But my new Mac, I cannot read this. My Mac here that I'm on, I can't read this. The only way I can read this is this dumb thing. So all these photos are on here, right? So it's one of those things when I have a print, right? That's driving me nuts that I can't find those things. Um, but when I have a print, guess what? That's always going to last as long as it doesn't get destroyed or shredded up. So I think when you're doing this like creative process and this whole thing, you got to create this whole creative circle. You got to make a print of some sort. So kind of a tangent, but it is what it is, right? So if you think about this whole process, this whole thing we do to create photographs, it's like a puzzle. So if you look at this, there's all these pieces, right? A puzzle isn't complete till we put that last piece in. Well, but you have all these other pieces of say a thousand piece puzzle that one at a time, it starts creating the image, right? And as we piece them together correctly, the, the image starts to appear and the more we work on it, the more we think about it and find these spots where they go, all these things come together to create the final puzzle image. So you can think of, if you look at this, I don't know if you can read them, but you know, like filters is a piece of the puzzle and lenses and composition and paper choices when you're going to print and color black and white, um, your exposure choices is it overexposed, underexposed, whatever, um, final print, you know, all that. So all these will start to piece together, right? And then create our final image. So all this whole processes thing is overall just, a giant puzzle and you know on a puzzle you don't have to take the you know some people like to start with the edges right i don't know i haven't done a puzzle in years but i always like to find the corners first and then you work there right that's a process it kind of starts you but it doesn't mean that you can't find two pieces that go together right away and that might be the middle right and then you piece it off of that and then you might find here so that process doesn't always need to be one through five in order i think it works best but again all this whole thing is like a puzzle and how you choose to put it together or your process is up to you. 
And I think it's just as long as you have some type of things we're always thinking about, right? Going through, even if it's a checklist like exposure, filter, do I need it? Do I not? But I'll get into that here momentarily. So, so right. So here it is. You know, all these things that I did, filter, um, ratio, what lens I chose, all those are puzzle pieces then allowing me to put it together and create the final puzzle or my final picture. So when you get into this whole thing, so I broke this down like in the, that, like I said, that four step process, but there's processes within process or, or checklists we could call them. So the first one's that photographic scene. Well, what does that mean? Well, we'll get into it. So to me, the whole photograph, oh, come on computer. Oh, got ahead of myself. Let's try this. There we are. Um, so when you're trying to see photographically, what does that mean, right? Well, it can mean lots of things. It's when you first get on to your image that you found, right? There's choices to be made in anything, right? I mean, you have to make a choice or we don't get anywhere. So the first thing is you got to figure out, well, what's your subject, right? And I think that I've said it before. A lot of people say, I don't know, I take a picture. Yes, you do. What made you stop? What made you think about taking the photo, right? That's your subject, or at least that's the starting puzzle piece. Doesn't mean you're gonna start with that one, but it is a piece where you can start adding it together and looking at it. So you can say, oh, well, maybe it was the tractor. I'll show you a tractor photo I did here a couple nights ago. And that's what made me stop. So then I started thinking, once I got in front of this subject, how am I gonna portray it? What do I need? What am I gonna do? You know, then you can think about this in a sense is how am I going to represent the scene in front of me? Am I going to do it in a creative fashion or am I going to do it in a representational way? So do I choose the creative way in camera or post process? Or do I just photograph it and deal with the post process later? You might look at it and say, I don't know. Like, I don't ever look at my images right away and say, OK, I'm going to be this right here and it's going to be this and it's going to be that and I have it all pieced together in my head sometimes but not always um but you can think of it do you want to do it creatively do you want to do it in a way that it's representational you know let's say this tractor that I photographed is um I think a farm all H could I go into photoshop use my skills and make the the farm all which we all know is red green I could or could I take a giant deer and make it pink or purple? I could. That's a creative choice, right? Does That's just a non-representational uh, portrayal of the image. Is it wrong? No. Is it right? No. It's just what, you, what you're trying to do. That's the creative side. Or I can photograph it as is, as red, but maybe the sky wasn't as dramatic. So I bring in a little bit more of the sky and things like that. And I bring up more um, detail or whatever. It's all things like that. So then we have to think of this choices of settings you know shutter speed is it fast or slow am i going to have an aperture real tiny so i can you know blur out the background of the flower or i'm going to shoot it at f22 these are all pieces of the puzzle right of seeing and how we're going to see it and then obviously the choice of iso do i want a really low iso to get a really high quality image well then what does that entail you know, in your head of the flow chart, well, I might have a slow shutter speed. So how do I counteract that by not hand holding? Well, a tripod, if, you know, it's things like that, that it's all those little pieces you're starting to piece together. And then it comes down to lens choice. Do I want a, a macro shot of the flower or the tractor? Do I want to use a wide angle? You know, maybe I got this really dramatic sky and I really want to show that, but that's not the main subject. I, but I want to kind of maybe show this vast landscape. So I use a super wide telephoto, which makes my subject still very small, showing you how vast the landscape is. Um, or I could use a standard 24 to 70. That's what I like to use. Or the telephoto, mine's the 70 to 200 a lot. So it's things like that. You know, do you need to bring it in closer and things? It's just all those little pieces, like sub pieces of this whole process thing. And it never hurts. Um, I mean, you don't have to do all these. I mean, you're always going to have to come up with shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. But you don't have to think as it, you know, do I need to be creative right now with it? Maybe you something stopped you, but you just can't find that piece quite yet. Like you're digging through the box still. That's okay. You'll eventually find it. So maybe that's the post-process part where we get creative. So you shoot it representationally and deal with the rest later. So it's just all, again, pieces of pieces of pieces adding up to being little things. So... Now there's like this, if I remember right, the six step 
kind of process of seeing as I've heard it before. Um, so everything in red is kind of like that main point. So seeing the light, composition, less is more, getting close, uh, work the frame, and then watching background and edges. Those are kind of like the six points you can think about now that we're composing the image, actually putting things together. So, you know, the big thing is light. You know, do let's look at the quality of light. Is it hard light? You know, harsh shadows. There's not a, a gradual transition from shadow to height light. It's just like a hard edge. You know, it, is that the kind of light I'm working with? And then how do I counteract that? Does that work with the image I'm trying to, to do? Like, Paul, you said that you're like, you know, maybe that tree that I'm trying to look for isn't best in that light, right? The tree made you stop. We go in and look at it and say, you know what? The quality of light here is not what I need to represent the photo that I wanna see. So you tag it and you come back later, right? That was a decision made now for a later date and time. You know, or you can be like, hmm, I kinda like the harsh light or the soft light, whatever it is. So that's gonna be that piece of the puzzle. Then you get into uh, quantity of light. How much light? Is it a lot of light? Is it high key, really bright? Is it real low key, real dark? Um, you know, how do you counteract that? Do you choose to, you know, I can make, like, I'm going to go out tonight as long as it doesn't rain here um, with a friend. We're going to do some night stuff. We're going to do some light painting. I haven't done that in ages. And that's one of those things is I can represent the photo as is. We could go to an alleyway, just use the, the current light to be real slow or real low, kind of underexpose it and kind of make it as it is. Or I could do a really, really long exposure and make it look like daytime, right? So it's that quantity of light. I can change that, you know? Um, I can underexpose on a really, really bright day and make it look darker. I can use a high-speed sync and flash and make daytime look like nighttime and stuff like that. You know, then it's highlights and shadows. How are those gonna play into the image? Um, I'll show you a tractor photo where it's got a nice highlight and it's kind of like a side back -like kind of shot that played in, where did that highlight come in? Where did the shadows come in? Do the shadows detract or add to the image, add value to it? Same with highlights, is it adding or subtracting to it? So it's just things like that. Then it's composition, right? So we've already looked at light and figured out those things. Now we could go into composition and say, well, how am I gonna compose this? How am I gonna, and really think of composition is how are you gonna compose the image to draw that viewer's eye to your subject? Is it up close? Is it making something kind of odd, like really big in the frame or really tiny where people have to search for it? Is it, you know, using leading lines or is it putting it in the center? Things like that, right? It's your main think of think of composition is how you're organizing this photo with elements and bringing all those elements together to support your subject and telling a part of that story. You know, it could be even color. Like uh, we were talking about Chuck Kimberly's work today. Um, with Diane, contrast. Am I dropping my image real dark, but I'm bringing the subject just oh so slightly brighter to make things pop off the background more? That's, again, it's not color in the sense of, you know, red, green, blue, pink, yellow. It is contrast, right? You can use contrast to draw. Like, you know, like I said this morning, your eye is drawn to the brightest part of the photo. So we make the subject bright, everything else dark, bam. That's how we brought our eye with composition or just, you know, in a sense, drawing the viewer into the image. Um, sometimes less is more. I think sometimes we just photograph and then we're done. But if we really take this into a process and think about it is there are elements in the image so every piece, like when I judge stuff, I look as like, is every piece of that photo, every little thing, is it adding value to that image, making it stronger, or is it is it taking the value out? That annoying like barbed wire fence that comes out of the side of the frame, does that need to be there? No, let's get rid of it. Can I do it by zooming in? Maybe. Maybe it's gonna change composition to the point where I don't want to. So now what, what's the next piece of the puzzle later that I can do, right? We talked about the whole removal of using AI in Photoshop. I played with it more this afternoon on some images. Then I, can, I now that's a piece of the puzzle I'm using to just easily remove that little piece of blade of grass or whatever, or that little piece of uh, fence. So it's things like that. Is it patterns? And you can use depth of field, you know, bringing the eye, based off of a very shallow depth of field, blurry background kind of thing. And then bam, there's your subject pops right off the background. Um, stuff like that. But 
less is more too, right? You don't have to have this overly complicated composition. I think sometimes the more things get complicated, the worse it gets. And then you get overwhelmed and you just stop. But just like watch your edges, keep things simple. You know, do you need to have, you know, 80,000 elements for the photo? Maybe if that is a part of the story, but if it's not, it doesn't need to be there. Then, you know, sometimes getting close. Subjects normally look better um, because that's, you know, you've brought in your subject so, or you've used your lens to bring your subject in so close, that is the only thing you see. So therefore you don't have any of those distracting elements. Um, and then there's another thing I like to do, it's called working the frame. I talked about this morning with you, Diane, we were talking about underexposing an image, making it way too dark and one too bright and then one normal. So I have all these different exposures I can work with. Um, it's changing perspective. I went high with a camera, I went low. Maybe I went right and left, up and down. Right now I have five or six images. Now is it, think creatively, like maybe I don't have to, I did a photo of this car that was next to the tractor this week, Friday night, I think, or whenever it was, um, or Thursday night. And I focused on the, the barbed wire fence and took the, uh, car in the background and just so slightly took it out of focus, right? It's things like that. Um, and then you got to think, am I finding something extraordinary in the ordinary, right? Is it something I drive by every day and I see or everybody drives by and sees, yeah, it's a tractor in a field. How do I make that more interesting? Um, and then it comes down to watching your backgrounds. You know, can I move my perspective while I'm working the frame to get rid of a distracting object in the back? Maybe it's a really dark spot. You know, I've got a really bright image and then bam, there's this like quarter sized dark blob in the background. Maybe I don't want to again, change my composition so I can go in and Photoshop it out. Or maybe it's like a really bright spot drawing your eye away from it, things like that. And then it's anything really, it's taking your viewer's eye away from the image. So it's things like that. So just watch your backgrounds and your edges. No questions so far. I'm I'm okay with that. Not all. That sounds horrible. I always want to add questions. So, um, ask them what if you've got them. So here's one. So we're looking at light, right? Um, I'm gonna get rid of this QR code. Give me a second. It's blocking everything. Come on. There we are. So light, right? This is where I'm using light now to draw. You know, making it a more interesting photo. This was a barn. The rope was there. I stepped on it. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I walked up two little steps in this barn to the hayloft. I shot it straight down, but that light is coming through a slit in the, the old barn, right? So I'm making it more interesting with the use of light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, come on. Oh, hey, Connie. I'm sorry. I just, uh, Oh, Connie made it to Pelicans. <laughs> Don't tell me you're at Pelicans the entire time. <laughs> um, uh, how, so how am I filing different versions of a photo? Um, in Lightroom, I just keep them as is in order as I take them. I have this really weird thing. I can't remember if I locked the door in the house and go somewhere. But as I'm scrolling through Lightroom, I can tell you in my mind the photo I'm looking for is before these set of photos, this set of photos, and that set of photos. It's really weird, but it works. But um, all my final images are cataloged in the end with, um, I tag them with a keyword in Lightroom. It says final image. So if I'm ever looking for that, I can find it. And then all the corresponding stuff will kind of be within the general vicinity. So hopefully that answers your question. So here's the tractor, right? So this is composition. Um, a couple things I did here. One, it's kind of interesting in a sense because it's, it's a fairly decent tractor. I don't know why it's not going around in circles for anybody, but um, it's been here long enough that the tree keeps getting bigger every year. Um, I can remember when that tree wasn't very big and I had a for sale sign on the tractor um, and it never moves, right? So there it be. So now I've used composition where it's kind of rule of thirds, not completely, but it's off center to make it a little bit more interesting. Now, if I would have shot this square format, like a square ratio or one-to-one -one ratio, I would have put it in the center um, because it would just look weird, I think, otherwise. I also used, you know, um, oh, what do I want to say? Oh, it escaped my mind. But this was the big one was composition. But again, 
I didn't get it too close to the edge. Look, I have some negative space. So I can use negative space around that tree so I don't have that whole dumb tree stuck up against the edge of my frame. Um, so, oh, sorry, Diane. I just, that was your question about how am I finding that was Connie. Sorry. Oh, well, see. Um, but, you know, you can use composition, right, to portray an image differently. Um, you can do the aspect ratio. This is 16 by 9. Now, I, my camera will allow me to change that as I photograph, but you can do this in Lightroom as well or Photoshop. Less is more. So the sand dunes, right? Um, I used a couple things here, a little bit of light. So I got the light on that left sand dune, but it's less is more, right? Um, if this is the image, I'm thinking, yes, it's hard. You won't be able to see it because they're too, so freaking tiny. But there's only really three elements with this in, in this image. There's the sand dunes, the clouds, and very tiny, like microscopic little specks on that far ridge is, I think, uh, two people hiking. You know, so less is more. It doesn't have to be overly freaking complicated, you know. I got lucky here. The clouds started popping up, rolling in. So I was sitting there waiting, watching, photographing other things. And I kind of seen the scene. So I photographed it. You know, I didn't go in and Photoshop out any clouds around it to make this. That's just how it was. Could you do that if you want? Yes, I don't see a problem with that. That's your creative choice. So then get close, right? You know, this is just a macro shot. And I did a macro day at PhotoPro eight eons ago. This is just taking a regular... I think it was like the banana tree they have over there and just photographed it up close. You know, it's nothing spectacular, but it's something, you know, using up close to bring your, to bring, you know, me what I need to see, right? The leaf or the whatever you want to call it. So now here's work the frame. So two different images, same subject. So I saw the, what made me stop was the tractor for the first picture. That's how I saw it out of the corner of my eye down by Solon. It's not very hard to find. So then I found a place to pull off and I photographed it what drew me there. But then I worked the scene. I shot it in square. I moved it here. I moved around. Well, then I went at an angle. I have a shot where it's straight on side shot of the tractor. I have this one here to the right where it's more at an angle. This is the one where I love where it's a little darker on the front side of the tractor because that's the shadow side. But that sun you know, the sun was awesome because of the smoke from the uh, wildfires. But if you see this larger, there's a really nice glow along the top uh, highlight along the tractor down behind the farm all uh, emblem and down. So it's kind of nice. So you got a highlight side and a shadow side. Um, but this is just going in and working the frame to have more images. You know, now every one of these compositions, I may have one that's too bright, too dark, whatever. So it's not like I just make one of the images too bright, too dark. I still work the frame continuously through the entire uh, process. Um, and then sometimes I'll think of things and have to go back. But you can use, you know, working the frame to do that as well. So backgrounds and edges. So this is one, if you look at the very bottom uh, front end of the truck that I did, there's grass there. Um, I took it out in Photoshop. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't there. Um, Diane was asking me today, why did I make the compositional choice of cutting the bottom of the truck off? Because there was lots of distracting. This is a yard ornament for somebody down by um, Coralville Reservoir. It's parked here. It's got buckets and rusty things all around it at the bottom. And I thought that those detracted. Hey, Mary, uh, detracted from the image. So I made a choice in composition to photograph parts and pieces, you know, maybe it might make somebody think what's out of the frame that could be there. So it's things like that. Um, but here, the edges I used, I went out and just took out the grass. It's just the way I wanted it, right? It's a, it's a, a cre creative choice, we can call it. So now here's the second image, right? It's all gone. If you look at the front of the truck, it's all gone, right? Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell people, whoa, oh, no, I, you know, um, you know, it's somebody's ornamental grass, so I'm not going to go out and clip it off. Now, if I'm in a road ditch, I'll just rip the grass over, right? Because it's just a road ditch. But, you know, this is something that I noticed while photographing it because I took my picture and I looked at it. And I'm like, ooh, I don't like that. So then I, in, instead of before knowing there's two, I have two choices here, I can Photoshop it out later, which I don't love to do as I hate Photoshop and lots of editing. But I was like, 
can I crop it out more with the lens by zooming in? Yes, but then I was losing more of the truck and I was running the bottom of the frame along that chrome and I didn't like it. So I had to make the choice then, if I keep it the way it is, I have to use Photoshop to remove the grass. So therefore I have to, ooh, that spilled my coffee. Um, so this is the backgrounds, you know, there's some little blue back there, some little flowers, um, but, this is one where there was some really distracting stuff in the back, so I kind of moved around a little bit, and, you know, and found a composition that I liked with the least distracting background. Um, I mean, if you can blur out that distracting object a lot with depth of field, then more power to you do it um, if you don't need to move around. This one I got lucky on. If you look really close, there's a little bee, like a flying up to the flower i was that was not on purpose i'm not going to tell you i waited for him to fly there i was actually just photographing the flowers and he showed up and he happened to show up in the plane of focus it was in focus so that was luck that was not planned so now let's talk a little bit about more composing the image side the second piece of the puzzle we'll go through the last two pieces of the puzzle in two weeks um, but composing the image right so when you're composing an image now, we're looking at things like camera position and studying the scene and analyzing the light even more. So when you go to compose it, it's obviously composition, but it's camera uh, position, right? Everybody forgets the camera does this, I, right? I do it all the time. We can go vertical. Um, it will do that. So I can go vertical, horizontal. Maybe it's, you know, taking that camera going really high or really low. Maybe it's going really low with the choice of a wide angle lens, you know, and make a road or something go real wide in the front of the foreground all the way to the background real tiny. It's things like that, but it's just camera position. Remember, we don't have to be at our height. So if you're five foot tall, you don't have to shoot the world at five foot tall, take a ladder or lay on the ground. I get stuck where I'm always photographing six foot tall, right? Because that's how tall I am and I forget. You know, I can even lower it now to my waist and use the, the uh, articulating screen to come out and look at it this way in a sense. So it's all these different things you can do. You just have to remember it. And when you have a process, guess what? Um, there's things you can think about. So the other thing you're doing when you're studying the scene, like we've already looked at light kind and things like that, but think of overall balance. Those elements that were choosing to add in or take out, is that creating like nice harmony within the photo? They're all making sense. They all go together. Um, you know, if I'm trying to break up a pattern, like I'm using pattern in a compositional way and I have four posts, most of the time people say use the rule of odds go three. But I notice that it's yellow, blue, yellow, yellow, right? Why wouldn't I do four? So the that color in a, in a good way is throwing off the balance to make it more interesting. But I also have to still look at shape, line, color, form. How are all those things playing in? You know, shadows, highlights, is the shadow pulling me away out of the image versus in or however I'm choosing to use that. And then obviously our subject, we gotta have a subject. Um, you know, I think at bare minimum, we gotta have something that, I don't like when I look at a photo and I do it a lot too. I post photos where there's no probably obvious subject um, but it's one of those things, if I'm looking, is like, I want to know that the, what I'm looking at, right? I got to have something that's at least interesting. But then when you get down to analyzing light a little bit more, you know, light intensity, the light, you know, how bright it is or how dark it is, it, you know, I don't want it really dark. Maybe um, I will choose to, you know, expose it longer with shutter speed or let in more light with the aperture or raise the ISO to brighten it. And that's going to make it brighter and give me a different look. Now I'm gonna work the scene and maybe I'm gonna underexpose it. You know, use a longer shutter speed to let, let, let less light in. I'm gonna stop my aperture down from really big opening to let all that light into something really tiny to let in less light that way. Or I'm gonna drop my ISO, however I choose to do it. Um, but then am I using colors? You know, um, Diane made a very valid point today um, on my truck, there's complementary colors you know, the sky and the truck color, things like that. Are you doing um, choices like that? Um, the direction of light, you know, is that light source predominant? Like, do I know where the light's coming from? Does that add or subtract from the photo? Sometimes if I want to add the light source like the sun, I wouldn't have added the sun normally to that photo or the tractor on either or because it would have been so freaking bright, your eye would have gone right up to the corner and not to the subject. But I knew the wildfires, what happens when you get wildfire smoke? 
Can I sit here and cry in my coffee all night long and say, woe is me, I haven't taken a picture in six months and there's nothing I can do because there's cloudy smoke and it's, I can't, you know, do this or that. Yeah, I can, but I can know what else it's going to do. It's going to give me a really nice orange sunset. So why don't I use that to my advantage? So it's things like that. Um, and then in this whole process of the light thing is, is there any filter or is there any tool that's going to help me enhance my image? Like, a neutral density, is that gonna help slow my shutter speed down to blur water? Is that gonna add or subtract value to the photo? Or is the polarizer gonna take the shine off the leaves? Yes, it would. Is that gonna to add to the photo? Probably, would it subtract? Probably not. So it's things like that you can think of. But it's all these little things they start analyzing. Oh, so Paul says, sorry, Paul. Um, do you change aspect ratio in camera when out shooting? I do. So I, I, I will, I almost shoot, I bet you, geez, on a normal basis, I do three ratios every time. I always do 16 by nine. I don't know why I've fallen in love with that one. And then I do square and then I do the normal full frame three by two or whatever the hell it is. Um, but those are the three that I always seem to do. Um, sometimes if I need an extra reach and get more out of my lens, I'll go to the DX crop mode um, and then bring it in closer with that mode. But yeah, I do change it. Um, Sometimes if I don't have time, because it's a quick moment happening, I will usually, I always change it back from say 16, nine. If I shoot that, I don't leave it there as soon as I'm done. Or if I use one to one and I leave it a square, I don't leave it there. I go back to the normal FX three, two ratio. If that's what it is, if I remember, because then that's going to be more normal and any spur of the moment, it's going to be easy to compose because Composing an image for regular kind of ratio versus a panoramic or a 16 by nine or a square is different. So it just depends how you choose. But I do, I switch them all the time and then I switch them back to my normal. So good point. So let's talk about analyzing light. So here's a photo that I did at, um, at a, the honor flight, Jimmy Christmases, um, at Arlington National Cemetery. So there's one thing I noticed here. I was just standing or waiting around. I noticed a lot of things were in shade and there's that bright, those, the stones are lit up by the light. So I purposely underexposed this a little bit. So everything would kind of fall dark around it, like a vignette. And then my white would pop off the background or the white stones would pop out of this darker image. So I analyzed the light. That's what drew me into the, the image. Then I had to figure out how to compose it and then what I needed to do. The other thing I was really paying attention to at Arlington is all the headstones, if you get at the right angle, all line up. This one is kind of goofy from the angle I was at, but it's things like that, it's a pattern. I think I have another one here, I'll show you. Maybe I don't. Ah, there we are. So here's one. So if you look, the tree kind of frames the headstones again. This is a pattern. So if you look in the right where your eye, I'm hoping your eye goes straight to the background because it's that, opening in the tree because the stones in the front um, are out of focus. So I'm hoping your eye goes straight to the back is what I'm hoping happens. But you'll notice all of them are at an angle. There's a pattern of a line. So, you know, all the way, even the tree, the tree breaks up the pattern, but the pattern starts again. So it's things like that. So I always said if I ever got to Arlington National Cemetery that I wanted to, you know, really I really wanted to photograph there and I thought never in God's green earth would I ever get up there and guess what the moment came. So don't always think that you'll never get to do something because never what I thought I'd do four national parks in a year, possibly five and I've done it this year. So it's one of those things is, you know, I still look at images that other people have taken and I'll look and say, wow, that's a cool image, but I see an image with an image, even though I might not ever go there it's still I'm practicing seeing and composing in my head. So if I do A, ever get there or B, come across something similar or that equation would work in a similar scene, it's kind of like already planned now. So then when you get into lines, Arlington, right? Lots of lines here, vertical lines, there's the curved line, um, you know. Oh, what else did I lost it? I was gonna say something, I don't know where I went. But, you know, you got a lot of vertical lines. You have arches and, you know, they kind of keep going and going. And you have that kind of brighter area where hopefully your eye goes and then that area around it's a little darker. So it's things like that. So this is where you're using lines while composing an image. Color. 
So this one is a night photo, obviously. Um, I'm still always looking for neon signs. And this is the old Firestone building across from PCI here in town. And if you look at it, there's two types of color here. You have a warm Firestones in red, and that's kind of like giving that nice like glow to the foreground. But we have the cool colors of the blue and the kind of clear, clean light inside. So, you know, you're playing color balancer. You know, if this was all just red, I don't know if I'd like it as much. But I also made a choice in my mind to under I, to pretty much expose and edit this image for the Firestone sign and the inside of the building. And I don't care about the rest because the rest of the building is boring and old and ugly. It doesn't really add to anything. So therefore, I can make exposure decisions to add or take away or make an exposure decision within post-process. Um, so then, as we get in, sorry, my wife just texted me, it popped up on the computer. <laughs> um, then, using light, this is like, this is a day I would tell you that most people wouldn't want to shoot. I didn't want to. This was at Glacier National Park, and, the, and it was shitty weather. It was rainy all day long, and it was cloudy, and I had to wait for breaks in the cloud, but it added dramatic, you know, lighting in a sense, you know, the break in the clouds, the mountain you know, up there is really bright. It's darker around because I have all this sun kind of protruding through these holes in the, the clouds. So it's things like that. You're, you know, you're using light as a compositional tool as well. So here's the one of the tractor more up close. Um, hopefully you can see it. There's that nice um, right on the farm all side. Well, the farm all side closest, which would be your logo along the right side of the H tractor. That's a little darker, but I have that nice highlight side on the top because that sun is giving me more of a backlit kind of side light. So I've got a nice rim light across the top and it falls down the left side of that grill. You know, I would love to have shot the grill straight on with the farm all being out with a shadow side and a highlight side. But for me to get straight on, it was so far away. I'd have to have probably like a 600 millimeter lens to guess what, fill the frame to where I want it, where I don't have all this distracting elements of bushes and trees and just nonsense in it. So that's when I don't have it. So I have, you know, I had the choice. I could have hopped the fence and photographed it, but that's not kosher in my book. <laughs> so I'm going to go through these really quick, but if you want to read into these more, these are, is what professional photographers of America calls about the 12 M 12, gee, many Christmases. 12 elements of a merit image. So for you to get a merit, like get a point to get a merit thing and the PPA to get things to be certified and awarded and all that stuff, you can hit these and all that good stuff. Um, but they talk about ink impact when you're looking at an image. This is how they're judged. So they look for impact. Is it a compelling image? Is it going to evoke an, evoke an emotion, laughter, sadness, anger, pride, whatever? I look at impact. Is it going to make you feel? I don't care if it's makes you feel happy and makes the other person sad. That's not a loss, it made somebody, everybody's gonna feel differently about it. Technical excellence, the quality of the actual image presented for viewing, so retouching, sharpness, printing, color, exposure, all that should be spot on, right? I think that just makes, in a sense, doesn't have, well, in this sense it needs to be spot on, but in most senses maybe you don't um, you need to make it perfect. but. You know, is creativity, is it original? Have we all seen the pictures of the uh, grizzly bear in Alaska where all the salmon are jumping into the mouth? Yes, everyone's done that. Everyone who goes there, that's what they go to photograph. Is that creative? No, everyone's done it. Maybe you get a different angle or maybe you get the fish slapping the bear in the face, right? That's different, have you seen that? No, so now that's more creative. Style. We talked about that before. So is, does the subject matter that you have presented on print, is that giving the styles all that kind of like included the char characteristics, the ways that you as an artist is going to go in and apply a style of editing to this image with lighting? Did you choose the right lighting or posing if it's a portrait or the compositional? Does all that play in to the image. If I'm shooting a night scene per se, I don't know if this is the greatest example. Well, let's put it this way. Let's say you're photographing a muscly man or woman in the gym, right? Weightlifter, professional, you know, bodybuilder. Usually those are low key kind of images so you can see muscles, right? And get better shape and form because we can 
you know, use lighting to make things look better than they are, right? So guess what? If I add the editing to that and make it high key so you don't see muscle definition, is that right? It's not wrong. It's not right. It's your choice. But if I was going for that, maybe it's not the best style to use for that. Then there's composition, right? Is all the visual elements of the image, you know, come together with intent. Anytime you, I think anytime you turn this thing on and you go click, there needs to be intent behind it. If I do this click, 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 and I don't use this process we're talking about or thinking, that's not intent. This is documenting, taking pictures, looking at settings, figuring out creativity, technical excellence, impact, composition, all that stuff. That's intent. You're going forward with intent to make an image. Um, then if you know you go in with that composition, is that taking the viewer's attention, directing it where it needs to be? You're leaving light and going out of the frame and stuff like that. Um, PPI is very big into the world of presentation, like having a border with a, a line around it and this and that, and that all plays in. Does it need to be that way? Uh, no, um, it can be a white border for all I care, but color balance. Does all the color within the image work together? I'm not using colors that are conflicting, you know, things like that. Um, center of interest. Do I know what my subject is? Is it interesting? You know, is that what I'm having my viewer focus on? Um, lighting. Does the image demonstrate excellence with light, like controlling light if you can, or is it weather? You know, is it added light, or maybe it's a mix of natural light with man-made light or artificial light like flash? Does it all balance and jive well together? Um, subject matter, right? Subject matter is, you know, central to the story being told. So let's say I'm trying to tell the story of a farmer during harvest out in a field, and I have a ballerina there instead. Um, right? Sorry, my wife is now calling me. Um, <laughs> so she's an hour ahead of me, so she forgets I'm live. Um, then if I replace farmer with ballerina, is that telling the story if I add that ballerina photo into all the other farmer photos? No, that's throwing off the whole subject matter. Now, that's a creative image. Maybe it stands on its own. Um, then storytelling, you know, does all everything it adds in, does it evoke emotion, all this, is it telling the story? If I'm trying to tell a story of, say, a city hit by a tornado, first thing that comes to my mind, you know, if I photograph, I don't know, somebody super happy, like smiling and having fun in the middle of the street, I, I don't know, maybe that's a moment that's like, hey, they're making the best of it, but probably maybe not go with the whole storytelling thing. I don't know. I just made that up. But it's things like that. Um, it, those are just like the 12 things that kind of pop in. So let's look at impact. Um, I don't know if this photo really has impact. Um, I've got another one probably has more impact here in a moment. But, you know, this is creativity. We've all seen photos of the Vietnam Wall, but this is one, two, three, four, six veterans reflection within the Vietnam Wall. So if you have this really big and you know it's Vietnam Wall, maybe you can start making a story out of it. It's things like that. Um, there we are. Here's the one um, that I showed you guys today. This is impact to me. Um, it's a very, probably a little bit more impact for me because I saw the whole thing leading up to this and the prior things beyond it. But I think if you know it's the Vietnam Wall, you read his hat, it says Marine on it. Um, if you know it's Honor Flight, you can start putting things together. It is a pretty, I think, visually or in sense, emotional, maybe not more of impact, emotionally uh, driven of an impact. Come on. This one. So this one I really like. This one I overlooked for quite a while. Um, I, this was one shot, one. I did not take more than one. I got lucky is what it is. Some of this is all luck, I'll tell you that. Um, I just thought it was kind of cool. It's a very solemn moment. Um, I love how he has his jacket thrown over his shoulder. Um, but he's looking at the backside of this guy's uh, headstone, U.S. Army, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam vet. Um, so, you know, all that, you can start looking at that and reading the headstone, and you can see the headstones in the background, and he's just kind of looking at it. I thought that was kind of a cool moment. Um, this one I added to the, the slideshow, so hope, or for Easter Island Honor Flight, so hopefully this guy gets to see it. But, you know, I don't know what he's thinking but it could be anything. I mean, he probably doesn't know the guy, but I think from a standpoint of a veteran myself and him, you know, 
we all had some connection to Arlington, whether we knew somebody there or not, um, because we know some of those guys gave lives for, you know, during conflict, some didn't, but in the end, they all served in some capacity. So it's things like that. I could have all these images in a story and have a bigger impact than normal. Um, also part of this is lighting, right? You've seen this one before. It's that little blip of light lighting up that tree. It's great in color, but it's even more impactful and lit well when it comes black and white. So I need to get this one printed. Um, if I keep, I keep, I looked for like 20 minutes for this one today to put it here. Um, then it also comes down to, oh yeah, light, huh? I had three blank slides. I don't know why. There's all, it wouldn't be a slideshow. So there we are. So that's all I've got for tonight because the first two pieces of the puzzle are photographic seeing and then composing the image. But next time, not next week, Next week, we're gonna kind of insert um, seeing subjects in a different light. So maybe breaking some of this subject matter and how to see something differently to add to your process and how to do it in between here. But uh, in the following week, we'll talk about the post-process part, how we edit photos and what can we do post-process wise that's gonna add into our process. And that's envisioning your final print or your final image, whether that's in front of me right now, and I know what it's gonna be, or is it later on? And then also that same night, I will talk about the final print or the final image, things we can do with it, all that good stuff. So that is all I have for tonight, but so I could have been here for another hour talking about the other two pieces. Come on. So a reminder, I always have a reminder, right? Very important. So if you don't know, I got a new job. So I will be working Department of Corrections. I now work weekends, which means Saturday nights, because I work second shift, 3 to 11 p.m. I can't do this at work. So I took a poll on Facebook, and a majority, 73% of you said, we would love Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. If you're in bed already because you get up at the crack of dawn to go to work, that's okay. You can watch these on YouTube as a rerun. But I have a new option in my system, per se, that when I, I'm done ending the stream tonight, it's going to ask me, do I want to restream this live again for people to watch? So I think what I'm going to do is starting that week, I'll have the date here in a moment, is starting from that date in July, I'm going to have it rerun every Saturday night at 8 o'clock, so you're used to it. Um, if you can't watch it on Tuesday night live to ask questions, feel free to watch it on Saturday night or on YouTube. Comment your question on YouTube. If if I don't see it, if I don't respond like when 24 hours, like message me through Facebook and send me the question, I'll answer it. Um, but you know, if it's one of those things with a super long answer, I'll just shoot a video maybe and mail it to you or whatever. So there's options. So you're gonna be able to still see it live and see it not live. So um, I was really, I'm, I'm kind of terrified about switching it to Tuesday evenings. Um, because what's funny is when I was thinking about second shift and do I take the position this kept coming up in my mind. I'm like, ah, I don't really want to change this, but it is. But I think it's going to be fine. I'm just going to take my hands off the wheel and see what happens. But I know everybody's going to support me. I just have to um, trust that it's going to happen, not trust that you're not going to support the show still. But you're going to come still show up in some form or factor. So there's my terrifying moments. So stay tuned, right? Because I always have the next stuff. So we're getting down to the nitty gritty of the ones I already have planned. So next week, we're gonna talk about seeing subjects in a different light, no pun intended. Um, seeing how you can photograph something that you photographed a million times or something that's been photographed a million times, then how do we um, come across that? So next Saturday, as far as I am aware, I am not working, I start Monday my new job. I'm working first shift for the first two weeks. So assuming, assuming, I still have Saturday off. He didn't say anything about that, but I'll find out this week. Um, the following week, we're gonna continue tonight's conversation about creating a post-process workflow. What can we do post-process? And my post-processing workflow is like the Wild West. It's all over the place. And then the final um, on the 11th. So July 11th will be the first Tuesday evening if I did it right um, in my head. So that will be the first um, uh, night where we'll have the whole um, revamping of the evening. Oh, uh, Mary says, what am I exactly doing at my new job? Uh, it's interesting. I'm 
within the Department of Corrections. I won't well, some people know, but I'm not going to tell everybody in the whole world since this is on the internet. It's just Department of Corrections. I won't say exactly where. Um, oh, good, Connie. Anticipate Tuesday nights will have less potential conflicts. I think maybe because people won't be doing things on the weekend. So I hope cross my fingers that as well. Um, I'm, I'll be a residential officer, so it's... I don't even know if I truly understand what I'm doing all the way because the job description was like four and a half pages long. Um, it's corrections, so however you want to take corrections. So um, it's one reason I switched was I'm tired of sales, to be honest. I hate I'm tired of sales, um, especially what I was doing. But this gives me an opportunity to maybe make a difference in the world for the most part or have the ability to instead of taking people's money every day so it's a lot of it'll be a lot of stuff so maybe i can explain it in better terms when i get farther into the job but lots to learn um i was told it'll be about a year of training so but i'm excited for it nervous and excited so lots of things to remember so as always thank you um if you want i'll just pop it up there um if you want to support the show, you're more than welcome to uh, scan the little doohickey, leave a tip. That's all I'm going to say about that. I don't expect anybody to, but if you feel that it's necessary, you're more than welcome to. But again, thank you. As always, I enjoy. We had seven people. That's not bad for tonight. Um, I know there's a lot of people who watch this post and don't comment or anything, so I thank you people. That's horrible to say. Uh, you wonderful people. Um, to come on you know after this and see it but if you got questions you know where to find me um coffee and clicks if you didn't know from previous shows that has moved um to the third saturday um for at least the rest of the year it may go back second but i may just keep it third saturday of the month it's things like that so i thank you guys for showing up asking questions doing things showing here um if you guys want i'm kind of struggling tomorrow i'm going to plan on maybe extending out like I always do and picking more topics for beyond July 11th. Um, so if you have something you want me to ramble about for an hour or more, uh, shoot it to me. I'm always willing to listen. That's what I'm hoping. Um, you can send me something. Oh, you are welcome, Connie. You are welcome, Corey, as always. Oh, yes, for this morning. I loved it. We talked way longer than 11, but I'm always there if people are asking questions. So, But I will let you all go because I have to get out of shorts and this sweatshirt and um go out because jeff just texted me and said are we gonna light paint or just take pictures so i gotta get ready for that maybe you'll see something tomorrow i don't know we got some ideas i don't know if it's gonna rain or lightning and go out to the middle of nowhere so again thank you guys for coming on and listening to me ramble you are welcome paul oh thank you diane um and all the information you are welcome that is what coffee and clicks is for so come with your questions it's not just me, you know, you got everybody's opinion today. So, which is awesome. So awesome. Have a good evening. I will see you all next Saturday, hopefully. And I'll probably run into some of you on Facebook in between and maybe in person. So have a good evening, everybody.